Hi, and welcome to Dutch the Podcast. Uh, my name is Mike, and right there is the publisher of Mokum Publishing, uh, Tom Byfoot. Now, uh, Mokum Publishing, you probably know as DeCrant, or Dutch the Magazine, or Dutch the Media, or, or maybe uh, a number of publications available through Mokum Publishing. Tom Byfoot, how are you doing? Welcome to your podcast. I am doing great. Thank you, uh, Mike. Uh, our very first podcast, so people know us from the magazine, the books, the newspaper, but uh, soon, hopefully, they'll know us from our podcast as well. I hope so. Well, I'll tell you this. We promise you uh, a lineup of great guests and uh, amazing stories coming up in the, uh, in the weeks ahead. So subscribe. Wherever you're listening or watching this podcast, go ahead and uh, hit the subscribe button and even the notification button. And uh, when a new episode arrives... You'll be the first to know about it. Uh, we, uh, as I promised, many guests, but they will come from Dutch the media, uh, places like Dutch the magazine. I would imagine that's going to be a great resource for us. Oh, absolutely, uh, Mike. I've got a couple of guests lined up already for our next uh, three podcasts uh, right now. Um, okay. They've all been featured in the magazine before, maybe not them personally, but at least uh, the topic they're speaking about. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I can't wait to get talking to them. Some, some very uh, interesting guests, I think, uh, we've got coming. Uh, also, I will point out, we would like to hear from you. So I will tell you right now, as the podcast progresses, take down the information you're seeing on the screen right now because that's where you can reach out to us, dutchthemedia.com. Uh, you can email us, uh, certainly uh, send a note along. And if, and if you'd like to hear something on the show or see something, uh, that's a great way to let us know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'd love to hear, well, uh, comments on the shows we do, uh, questions about the shows we do. Maybe we'll, every, every seven or eight shows, we'll be able to take some of those questions. And definitely, if there's topics you think we should cover in Dutch the Podcast, let us know through the contact form on DutchTheMedia.com. All right, there is, uh, just for a second more, uh, the uh, address where you can find us. Uh, all right, uh, Tom, why don't we do this? Well, we have an opportunity, and it's just you and I, uh, because in the days ahead, we will have, uh, as we point out, many guests and lots to get to. Maybe you and I can just uh, warm up the house a little bit with some discussion about the Dutch, you know, from 30,000 feet. Let's clear okay. up a few things. Okay, there's a lot to clear up, I'm afraid, but uh, yeah, let's, uh, what, what, what are you thinking of? What, uh, well, what springs to mind? Thank you for the opportunity to start with, because these might be basic questions, but I mean... Uh, let's say you're from England, you're English. Uh, if you're from Poland, you're Polish. If you're from Holland, you're obviously Hollandish Dutch. Now, how how is this? Can you can you unravel? Well, you, you did something really bad there, actually, Mike. You said Holland, uh, I, I, and yeah. uh, a lot of people. Well. Okay, let's, let's cover that first. Let's get that out of the way before I get lots of angry letters, and I'm sure I'll get angry letters. Don't on this be one. angry at Tom. I'm the I'm the ignorant one, and I'm, I'm, I'm not mad at you, uh, Mike. Not at all. You're speaking English, as we'll see. I think that's that's fine. You say Holland, you know. You say what you want to say. <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. Um, Holland is a term that's typically used by English speakers to denote. A country called the Netherlands. You know, we're talking right. about the country. It's in Europe. It's on it borders uh, Germany on the east, Belgium in the south. It's on the North Sea. That's a country that uh, we refer to in Dutch as Nederland. And if we use the term to describe people from there, you know, the adjective we say Nederlands. Uh, okay. The official word is demonym. The language we call Nederlands, but that doesn't work in English. In English, we say not Netherlandish. We say Dutch. Okay, okay. we'll get to that. Um, but um, what we haven't uh, touched yet on, um, we're getting there, is Holland. Um, Holland really is only a part of the Netherlands. Um, the Netherlands means low countries. Uh, currently, the country has 12 provinces. There's only two provinces that really strictly should be called Holland. They're the province I mean, of North. Uh, sorry. Am, I, am, I, am I wrong? I, sorry, Tom. Did I not take a ferry from Amsterdam with my bicycle over to Holland and go riding around in Holland on my bicycle? Or Do I have that well, correct? You, you, you may have done. Uh, it's a good place to go biking. Um, yeah. I, I don't know... Give me some names of uh, some cities that you uh, you visited. Well, I, I I would have to tell you that I just think that I went across the this uh, uh, I went across the uh, the major canal or the river 
over to Holland on what I recall being a ferry full of many, many, many bikes. Many bikes uh, at, at the station, and then uh, many bikes on the ferry, and then many bikes when we got off. And, and I recall thinking, and now we are in Holland. Okay, that, that may have happened because uh, Holland is only part of the Netherlands, right? The Netherlands is 12 provinces. Holland is only the two western provinces. Okay. They're called North Holland and South Holland. Um, but you have probably went to Amsterdam when you were in, in the Netherlands, right? I did, yes. Okay, you may have Rotterdam. You know, you may know them. Rotterdam, The Hague, maybe. The Hague, yes, yeah. Um, Gouda, Gouda, where we have cheese. Yeah. Mm. Um, a town called Alkmaar in the north. Um, all of these places, Harlem, um, are in those two provinces. So the most, m most of the major cities of the Netherlands are in those two provinces, which would explain why the whole of the country got that name. But there's ten other provinces that officially, to the letter of the book, are not really part of Holland. I'll okay. give a couple of names. You know, there's okay. Friesland in the north, there's Limburg in the south, okay. um, there's uh, Brabant in the south. These provinces are not formally part of Holland. But I okay. think, and I'm of the opinion, and I'm, I said I'm going to get letters about this, that when you speak English, it's fine to say Holland to denote the whole country. The country officially is called the Netherlands, or the Kingdom of the Netherlands, to be uh, completely exact. Netherlands means low countries. Uh, historically, the low countries were even much larger than uh, currently uh, the Netherlands. You know, it used to include parts of Belgium, uh, parts of northern France, even parts of northern Germany. But what we really see as the Kingdom of the Netherlands is what we call Holland in English. Um, but strictly speaking, just those two provinces. And generally, people from outside of those provinces uh, would resent the term Holland when they're speaking Dutch, but pretty much everyone refers to Holland when they're speaking English. You ask someone from Limburg, where are you from, in English, he'll probably say, I'm from Holland. And then if you right. say, where in Holland, he'll say Limburg. Strictly speaking, he or she would know that that's not correct, but that's just the uh, usage as it is. So uh, the reason the country took that name of, uh, of Holland is those were historically by far the most powerful of the uh, territories of, of the Netherlands. Uh, it's the old county of Holland. Um, all the major, most of the major cities are there. It's not fair to say all, but most of the major cities are there. And, and even today, 40%, almost 40% of the population of the Kingdom of the Netherlands live in those two provinces. So uh, that's how that came about. You know, you, you, um, does you that does that sort of um, explain a little bit? When you ask the right guy the right question, you find out exactly what you want to know. Thank you. So essentially, or even more, you you tolerate us in North America uh, saying you're Dutch, uh, you're from Holland, you're but from really, Holland, you're from the Netherlands, and you're Netherlish. Thank you for explaining uh, <laughs> that out, Tom. Yeah, well, that's the thing. I'm not that Netherlish, right? I'm, yeah. I'm not even Holland. I, I come, personally, I come from uh, the province of Utrecht, uh, very close to the Holland, Holland border. Okay. Um, I have no problem with uh, being called, uh, being told I'm from Holland. Um, so I, I think most people are fine with it. You know, Tom, if, if you don't mind, a couple of other uh, uh, points that I wanted to touch on. Um, you know, just some of the uh, stereotypical tourist stuff, because I would imagine a lot of people... Uh, plan, make plans to visit places that come up in the magazine. And, uh, you know, I, I wonder if maybe you have a top three uh, places that you would say, if you're going to do the Netherlands, here is a great representation of the country on the whole. Uh, you know, uh, you're looking for a specific uh, place that represents the country as a whole? Or the top. Oh, I'm, I'm, I, if I do that, I, I, I'm in deep trouble. Because, you know, the thing is, we have a magazine called Dutch the Magazine. Mm -hmm. it, we've, it, we've published 70 issues now. We like to cover the extent of the entire country. So I think there's something to find for someone everywhere in the country it's you know it's a, it's a wonderful country it's very compact it's very small so you can travel around easily true. if there's one place which i could mention where you might see or, or get a good feel for it i would say go to a place called maduro dam have you ever heard of maduro not, dam no well it's a um, skill model village it's in the hague um, and it's got uh, skill model uh, representations of all the major 
uh, buildings uh, in oh, the wow. Netherlands, from the royal palace to uh, to modern buildings, uh, even the latest uh, developments. They co are constantly recreating it. Go to Holland and you want to see all the important buildings uh, at a scale. I don't know exactly what the scale is, but um, they're, they're pretty good, good size. Um, then go to Maduro Dam. Then you've nailed it, and I've made sure that I didn't offend anyone. No, no, well done. You, and we will give you more destinations, I promise you, in the days to come. Uh, this leads me to the question then. Miniature villages are something that uh, arrive in certain parts. I've certainly seen them here in Canada, uh, Tivoli Miniature Village and that sort of thing. Is the miniature village idea something that hails from the Netherlands? You know, Mike, that's a very good question. And, I, I uh, wonder. I, I, I do not know. I, Every I, you know, has why, a very uh, Dutch area to it. There's no shortage of windmills at any of the uh, miniature villages that you go to. And now I wonder if oh, this is me. something that was inspired uh, from... Well, it's, you know... I'm, I'm always interested to find out more, uh, and it'd be great for the magazine if that were the case. So, you know, I'll look into it, and we'll get back to it in, okay. in a future episode. How about this that? Is, this is how you can uh, communicate with us. It's very open. Ask a question, and we will find out. And when I say we, of course, I mean Tom. Uh, Tom, before we uh, depart, a couple of things that I wanted to touch on. Uh, one of them is that uh, you represent at Mocum Publishing, and this is a great resource for people, um, a number of Dutch publications and books. One of them is your very own. And, and I, I don't mean to embarrass you or put you on the spot, but it's a fascinating book because as I ask you about the, you know, these miniature villages, do they hail from the Netherlands? Well, there are Dutch treasures all around us. And uh, you put together an amazing book. Can you talk to me for a few minutes about what you did with that book? It's, it's really cool. Sure, that's great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mike. Yeah, um, so I've been writing uh, for Dutch the Magazine for over a decade now, and so I've written a lot of stories. But one of the things we've always made a point of is we cover the Netherlands in Europe, but we also cover Dutch traces uh, of settlers right here in North America. There have been a number of immigration waves from the Netherlands to North America starting in the early 1600s uh, and really only wrapping up or still going uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, so I took 43 of those stories that I published in the magazine, particularly about the Dutch in North America, and I collected them in a book called Hiding in Plain Sight. Because one of the things you often uh, discover as a Dutch person in North America is people don't even realize often uh, how uh, extensive the influence of the Netherlands uh, and the Dutch on North America was, um, especially with the early settlements in mm -hmm. the New Netherland, uh, current, uh, currently uh, New York, New Amsterdam, currently New York, uh, parts of upstate New York uh, were populated by Dutch people um, for many, many um, uh, hundreds of years, actually, uh, and the language is spoken there until relatively recently. Uh, it only died out about 100 years ago. Um, but anyway, we'll, I'm sure we'll get to that, but if you want to get a head start on that, you mm -hmm. know, go to DutchTheMedia.com or go to Amazon or go to, uh, to Barnes & Noble or Chapters um, online and order Hiding in Plain Sight uh, by myself, and, and you'll be able to, uh, to read up on, on the influence of the Dutch uh, on North America. Here, we'll put that up for a second, and you can see the cover of it. Uh, all right, there you go. You can get the book, uh, Dutch the Media. Dot com. Uh, Tom, before we get out of here, one more bit of business. If you if you don't mind clearing up for me, uh, there's no there's no Dutchland. There is Deutschland. There's. I think that that's also confusing to people. There's Dutch. There's the Dutch, but then there's Deutschland. There's no Dutchland. Well, how can you unravel that one for me before we go? Do you mind? <laughs> yeah, I can unravel that. I don't know if I can do it quickly before we go, because that's quite a quite a, an extensive uh, story. Well, you know, um, I'm happy for you to, to, to uh, take your time with it. I'm not going anywhere. Okay. Well, okay. Stay there. Okay. <laughs> how, um, how about this? Um, have you ever heard the term dialect continuum? Uh, I'm going to no, throw I, some... I think that's from Doctor Who, no? <laughs> sort of. You, you get that weird sound and then you get um, transported through the TARDIS, right? Um, so a dialect continuum. You Remember when you were a kid, you used to play a game of telephone. Uh, 
Oh, you know, yeah. you'd sit in a circle, you'd whisper something yeah. into someone's ear, you'd start with a phrase, and then, you know, by the time you got to the uh, last person in the chain, uh, the phrase had changed uh, completely. Started with bananas, ended with apples. Yeah. Exactly, that kind of thing. Or you started with, um, I'm Tom, I'm from Holland, and you end up with, um, I'm Tom, I'm Deutsch. Um, and how did that happen? Right. So, um, Deutsch, uh, a, a dialect continuum. So, um, like a game of telephone, you have people live in village A, let's say, and they speak a certain kind of dialect. Um, and then there's a village a couple of miles over, uh, say village B, and they speak, speak essentially the same dialect. Um, slightly, maybe they have one or two different words for different terms. Maybe they call a field slightly different, a barn slightly different. Um, maybe they pronounce certain sounds slightly different. Um, enough so that the two people, or that two people from the two different villages, would be able to tell each other apart. But someone from outside and outsider wouldn't even hear the difference. Right now, repeat that, and the next village over, and the next village over. Every time you go over, there's a slight difference in the language to the extent that when you get to the edge of the continuum, um, and and you have dialect continuums all across the world. Everywhere, most language groups, most languages have them. Um, but you get to the end of the continuum, the people from two different villages in those uh, farthest away places might even not e even be able to understand each other. Of course, and but they're still with real tight proximity too. Uh, yeah, and, and and they still speak the same language. You can tell overall they speak the same language, right. but it's it's almost become mutually intelligible. Well, that's a dialect continuum now. Originally, in Europe, there was a West Germanic or Germanic dialect continuum, mm -hmm. which ran all the way from the North Sea uh, in, on, on the Belgian and the uh, Dutch coast, all the way through northern Germany and through Germany itself, right all the way to the Baltic and the border where the Slavic languages like Polish and Russian uh, begin. Mm -hmm. um, now, uh, traditionally, um, the people uh, on, on the northern end of that uh, continuum were called uh, Low Dutch. And um, the people on the uh, sort of higher lands, southern Germany, Austria, were called High Dutch. Um, so uh, to, 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 to look it up, I actually went up to the Oxford English Dictionary and I looked up the definition of Dutch. And would you believe that in the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the sort of standard dictionary for, for the English language, it says when you look up Dutch, it says the oldest now obsolete meaning of Dutch is of or pertaining to the people of Germany, German, Teutonic. So Dutch actually means German or actually used to mean because let's uh, make it make clear that it says uh, the obsolete. It does say obsolete. Yeah, yeah. Fair is fair. Now, um, all those um, different dialects that sort of slightly gradually changed. Uh, were really part of that l big, huge area where they spoke Dutch or German. Uh, it's only when dry lines start getting drawn on a map that you say, well, we have a language on that side that we call oh, oh, right. Dutch, and we have a language on that side that we call German. Of course. Um, there's, there's a very neat um, difference between a dialect and a, and a language. There's a very neat uh, definition given by uh, Max uh, Weinreich, uh, who's a linguist, and he said, uh, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. So okay. basically, a dialect, is, a language is a dialect with some power. It belongs, um, it belongs to the royal power or the ruler of that nation. Exactly. Wow. So when the, the nation states developed, then the dialects that were spoken on the west of the border uh, became to be called okay. Dutch, and the language on the east of the border started to be called German. Um, I, I'll tell you uh, a story uh, that sort of illustrates cool. the continuum, uh, if that's okay, if I still yep. have time for that. Um, I was traveling by train from, um, uh, from the Netherlands to Germany through a region called Twente. Twente is on the east. It's not in Holland. It's in the Netherlands. It's not okay. in Holland. Uh, I was traveling to Germany, and the train stopped as a station in the Netherlands, and a bunch of uh, young, uh, young kids get on, uh, teenagers, and they're speaking to each other in their own local dialect, um, which I had to strain myself. I was from the, from the west of the country. I spoke pretty much standard Dutch. Uh, I had to strain myself to understand them, but I could, <laughs> I, I could sort of make out what they were talking about. I would, could, could have given you a high-level summary, but I, I would have missed a lot of nuance. 
Okay, we cross the border. On the other side of the border, the German train conductor gets on, and he comes into our uh, compartment, he comes into our carriage, and he uh, speaks to me in high German, standard German, the German that they speak uh, throughout Germany, uh, a standardized language. And I could speak to him because, as most Dutch kids, I learned German in school. Oh, it's not a very okay. difficult language to learn okay. because the language, well, we're still in that continuum, see? Right. Um, so I show him my ticket, have a brief conversation with him, and he moves on. And then he moves to this group of young kids that had gone on uh, at the station. And he addresses them not in high German, but in his own local dialect. And he says, hey, you guys, our dialects are not that different. Um, I live on one side of the border, you live on the other, and we can talk to each other in our own dialect. And, and they have this animated conversation, the kids, and, and, and really they only live 20 miles apart. Their local dialects were much closer than my local dialect traveling from the west of the Netherlands. That's so that's, that's a typical illustration of what a dialect continuum is, but also why Dutch and German are on the one hand very similar, on the other hand uh, different. Um, is, is the dialect continuum fading over time? I mean, uh, it's funny, but you, you, you said that, you know, the youth got on, you could pretty much understand what they're saying. I, I promise you, Tom, my kids enter the room, I can pretty much understand what they're saying based on their slang and their own, their own uh, you know, sort of uh, dialect of, of youth. Um, I wonder if that is going to sort of level the playing field, not just in, in, in uh, Holland, the Netherlands, uh, but in many places in the world where that, uh, that has been very regionally very different in such a small area. Yeah, and, and, and you see that happening, obviously, under the influence of uh, mass media, yeah. uh, TV, radio. But that's a process that, that's been going on for a long time. Uh, standardized languages started to become relatively standardized in the 16th, 17th century. It was two Bible translations um, that helped develop the high German or German language and the Dutch language, uh, the Luther's Bible translation in the 1530s, yeah. uh, standardized high German, and then the Dutch uh, States Bible, which was um, uh, authorized by the Synod of Dort uh, in 1618, 1619, um, became the de facto standard for the Netherlands. They brought theologians in from all over the region, and, and they decided which words they would use to translate the original uh, Greek and Hebrew of the, uh, the original Bible. Um, wow. So it's been going on. That's the printing press really had the big influence there. The first mass media, the printing press, made sure that people you know, had to decide how to spell certain words. Um, now, that's how Dutch and German wow. diverged. Then lines were drawn on the map, uh, and so east... Uh, became German, west of that line became Dutch. Now, wh one thing, why did we get to keep the Dutch and why? not the Germans? Why, why did the why? Deutsch? Why is that? Because, very simple, because we were close to the North Sea, the Dutch were close to the North Sea, okay. they had a lot of uh, influence with the English, they actually had four wars with the English, uh, the Anglo-Dutch wars in those times. That so is the English um, of sorts, isn't it? Pardon? <laughs> that can be termed as a relationship of sorts. Yeah, sort of. And, and that's where you get words like a Dutch treat and Dutch courage. Right. The English didn't like the Dutch because right. they were fighting all the time. They wanted to you know, have control over the seas, control of the fish stocks, control of the spice trade. Uh, and that's, uh, that's so I, I'd like to say, you know, Dutch courage really refers to the Germans, but I can't really historically uh, make that stick. Plus, so, if you go um, back to your other reference, you know, these are outdated references and what. I am amazed, Tom, with your breadth of knowledge and then like the uh, precision with uh, which you reference it. Uh, more of this, I promise. I, I will ask more dumb questions to get quick <laughs> answers like that, I promise you, in the future. Yeah, uh, I, think, I think we sort of, sort of cleared up uh, Holland. Uh, does that make more sense now? And Dutch? It does entirely. And, and by the way, creating that proximity and uh, how tight a, a country uh, the Netherlands is, I think that was made clear to me day, uh, today as well, and, and uh, understanding that there's still these pockets of slight difference, even in just the language, and that would also translate to food and the, the region, what foods come oh, from there, and yes. all of that. So, uh, yeah. no, uh, I really language, uh, food, 
uh, and, and slight differences, the dialects really are quite extensively different. Uh, it could still be hard for me to understand someone who speaks a very strong Limburg dialect, for example. Limburg is the southernmost province, the, you know, the bit, little bit that sticks yeah. right into Belgium and Germany, if you look at a map. Or as I like to call it, the triumvirate of food. <laughs> it's <laughs> chocolate and cheese. and Anyway, it's cholesterol central, I, I understand, but uh, definitely worth making a visit to that area. Uh, listen, uh, if you wonder why Tom knows so much about all of this and can reference it so quickly, it's, it's because he heads up Dutch The Media. Uh, go to DutchTheMedia.com where you'll find this podcast, Dutch The Magazine and De Krant Magazine uh, newspaper. Uh, how often is uh, De Krant? Is that a... a, a De Krant is a, in, in the Dutch language uh, distributed throughout North America. Uh, it comes out every month. Once uh, and yeah. Dutch The Magazine is in English about the Netherlands, all kinds of interesting uh, information about the Netherlands, interesting articles. Uh, that is published every two months, so bi-monthly, six in a year. Tom, I am going to enjoy this. Thanks so much. This is episode one. Thanks for joining us, and we will catch you next time on Dutch the Podcast. See you, Tom. Okay. See you.